Mexico is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to gather in community on this territory. We are also mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. For me personally, I commit to the continual process of decolonizing myself. And please continue to use the chat to name the territory and where you are and perhaps the commitment as well. As we begin this gathering, uh, just a note around some of the broader context in which we gather. Yesterday is the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And also this past week has been a particular moment of lament and grief around anti-Asian racism and sexism. Now, of course, the realities of systemic racism, sexism, and misogyny are ongoing. And yet there are particular moments such as the recent shootings in Atlanta that can channel and sharpen anger and pain. So this week's events have heightened racial trauma in particular for people of Asian descent. And we'll have a chance to talk about that a little more over the course of this evening. And this will also be the focus of our opening prayer. This is a prayer of confession. And I would invite you to pray it with me with the words that are going to be on the screen. So let us pray together. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love for the weight of escalating anti-Asian racism revealed in hateful and misogynistic violence that is too much to bear alone. We call to you for help, recognizing that many of us are at fault as a society, we have failed to value and cherish all your peoples. We have wrongfully othered and rejected your glorious design in Asian people. We have enabled domestic terrorism and white supremacy to fester and flourish. We have hidden violence against women by ignoring, dismissing, and normalizing and normalizing complex interconnected systems that work to oppress. Have mercy on us, O God, and in your abundant compassion, receive our broken hearts as we cry with all who grieve lives devastated by the misogynistic violence of anti-Asian racism. And we mourn the recent deaths of the following. Dayung Feng, Haijun Grant, Sunchu Kim, Paul Andre Michaels, Sun C. Park, Zhe Zhu Ten, Delena Ashley Young, Young A. Yoon. All of these names are people from the March 16th Atlanta shooting, and we lament our failure to protect the rights of sex and migrant workers. Reveal to us the often hidden violence experienced by Asian peoples. Make us attentive to those among us who feel that they are struggling alone so that we might begin to heal together. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. And in your abundant compassion, put a revealing spirit within us. Teach us deep in our hearts that we are one in you and help us to find ways to live out this wisdom in our words and our actions naming and calling out anti-Asian racism and sexism until we are able to celebrate with gladness our future reconciliation where all people are protected and beloved. Amen. And this is a prayer that's um, on the United Church's website. And so now, without further ado, our keynote speaker. The Reverend Dr. Hayren Kim Craig holds the inaugural Timothy Eaton Memorial Church Professorship in Preaching at Emmanuel College in Toronto. She has led the United Church's mandatory racial justice workshops. She has taught and written about intercultural ministry, racism and colonialism as a post-colonial feminist scholar for more than two decades. And we are really glad she's here to share with us this evening. 
We are holding this event in part as a pre-launch for an anti-racism study guide that we hope to have available in the summer. And Heyran is the author of that study guide. So some of the content that you experienced today will be featured there as well. Welcome, Heyran. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am very, very honored to be with you today. Personally, I feel like this is the best way to mark the International Day for Eliminating Racial Discrimination to be in the same place and at the same time with others who are committed to anti-racism. This anti-racism work is a collective labor of love. We cannot do it alone. We need each other. We need people of all different racial groups. The end goal of anti-racism work of which our commitment to becoming an anti-racist church is a part is to eliminate racism from the earth. That is clear. It is a big goal and so we need one another. So Adele Tulls has told me that I have about 30 minutes tonight. And so let me do three things, uh, spending 10 minutes for each. For the first 10 minutes, I'll share a little bit about what is in the United Church Study Guide on anti-racism. After all, as Adele said, our gathering tonight is a soft launch of that resource. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the study guide as a teacher, like consider that first 10 minutes, like watching a trailer of a movie that is coming. The next 10 minutes, I want to invite us to engage a particular biblical text and explore anti-racism work from that biblical angle. And then final 10 minutes, let me share some tips about how to preach on race and racism by using this text, which we engaged. This study guide has four sessions and each session is complete on its own. So the PowerPoint, next slide please, Brian. What that means that you do uh, have one session without doing the other sessions because each session is complete its own. You can also use them in any order. But taken together, I imagined them to fit together like growth rings within a trunk of a tree. I am imagining a healthy tree, a tree that has four rings or more or at least four concentric circles within it. And each ring as a circle of life helps us dismantle racism. Each circle is unique, but all four circles are related to other circles like the rings of a healthy tree. Doing all four sessions will I hope give a big picture of how racism works and what we can do about it in a more fulsome way. Next slide, please. The first ring talks about racism on a personal level. Racism needs to start with each one of us. It is not a problem out there for somebody else. It is definitely not a problem of BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color alone. But we cannot leave this racism to the hands of white members of society either. In this first session, we investigate the question, where are you from? In order to really deal with racist perceptions of the other. Here, the first ring helps to question our own racial prejudice, ignorance, and unexamined assumptions. 
The second ring is about our church, looking at congregations as a community of faith. The study examines the art in our own church building, the music we play, and the songs we sing, and encourages us to critically evaluate who holds the decision-making power in those aspects of worship and other life of the church. In essence, we will explore how structural racism functions in these aspects of our life as a church. So this circle suggests concrete examples of how Christian life as a congregation and as a denomination can change and be transformed by this anti-racist work. The third ring looks at society in general and the police in particular with regards to anti-Black racism in the light of the killing of George Floyd. The study examines the genesis of the police and questions how the police have been used to target and brutalize particular racial groups. The study makes a deep connection between the modern day policing and state sanctioned violence in biblical times. After all, Jesus was murdered with the help of Jewish and Roman authorities. All of the gospels and epistles are written out of communities that experience violence and religious persecution sanctioned by the Roman Empire. The last and the biggest ring encompasses the very land on which we dwell. It showcases the indigenous claims to the territory on which we live and upon whose resources we depend. It invites us to explore how we might restore the land to indigenous communities and explains how doing this work is anti-racist work. Our General Secretary, Michael Blair, gave the Gandhier lecture at Emmanuel College earlier this month and said, we cannot create a beloved community when it costs us nothing. Apologies alone, not enough, if it costs us nothing. The same holds true of this gathering and the anti-racism study guide that I wrote. If this costs us nothing, it will not combat racism. The study guide showcases one concrete example that our UCC predecessors modeled when they handed their mission property in Korea over to the partner church, Presbyterian Church in the Republic of Korea. If our ancestors did something like that, we can do it too. And this is the legacy we need to pass down to our next generations. So imagining consecrate circles helps me get a handle on four different levels of racism and how they operate interdependently on a personal, ecclesial, societal, and material and economic and ecological levels. The goal of anti-racism work is to cultivate the fullness of the circle of life, it begins with each one of us. Racism matters individually as all of us are seeking wholeness and full dignity. Yet, each circle needs other circle. We need religious community. We need our national society and global community, and the very land on which we live. These all play a role in eliminating racism from the earth. And so we need to think about all these circles of being. 
Next slide, please. Each unit of the study has three organic movements, feel, think, act. I envision that a group in a congregation might use this study guide to engage in anti-racism work by taking time to feel and empathize with one another by thinking critically and analyzing the problem and by acting together towards change, creating a transformed reality. This very feel, think, act movement is the one I also propose as we engage scripture and prepare sermons for our congregations. So that was my first 10 minutes. How am I doing? <laughs> Let's now look at a particular biblical text. Here I am assuming that most of you who have joined today are preachers, regular preachers or occasional preachers, and that you will be thinking about anti-racist preaching. One of the first things you need to do is to select a biblical text. Two of the common questions I get are, how do I preach about racism and anti-racism when the Bible does not seem to talk about it? How can I connect the Bible with today's context of racism? These are good questions. And these are the questions many are asking. It is true that the words race or racism do not appear in the Bible. The very concept of race is a modern construct. It was a pseudo scientific invention that was used to justify the colonization of other lands and the enslavement of their peoples by Europeans and white colonialists. The etymology of the word race is raza, R-A-Z-Z-A or R-A-Z-A, which has its source in Roma, romantic languages such as French, Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese for colonializing nations. The idea of race is given extra potency when people took Darwin's theory of evolution in the 19th century, the heyday of British colonialism, and twisted it to justify a hierarchy of humans. For those of you who did the racial justice workshop, this information will be familiar. Given that race is a relatively new concept and racism is post biblical reality, it is natural to feel perplexed when looking for a way to preach on this problem. That being said, there are stories in the Bible that touch on discrimination against particular groups of people by other groups of people. There are also many, there are so many obvious stories of oppressions due to their economic, ethnic, gender, cultural, and religious differences in the Bible. The pivotal story of the Exodus, God's delivery of the Hebrew slaves out of Egypt is the story of one particular group's oppression over the another, and of course has served on, as an inspiration for black slaves and their ancestors seeking emancipation in North America. Another example connected to the story of the Exodus takes place in the book of Joshua, where we see a kind of ethnic cleansing happening as the Canaanites and their animals are utterly destroyed to make room for the Hebrews and their religion in the promised land. The Babylonian oppression of the Jews at exile might be cited. The story of Esther later in the Bible, post-exile, prefigures the 20th century Holocaust when Haman attempts to eliminate the Jewish people. All of these stories, even though they might not be historical, 
talk about situations in which one group of people who have been marked by particular heritage are subjugated by those with power to terrible persecution. In the Jesus era, ethnic differences between Romans, Jews, Samaritans, Greeks, and others figure prominently. These biblical stories mirror real lived experiences of people today who experience the modern phenomenon of racism in a number of settings, war, ethnic conflict, deportation, forced migration, and sexual violence, to just name a few. In addition to these biblical stories, there are many others that connect to the issues of racism in more subtle ways as well. The correlation between the text and the context is the work all good preaching does. In fact, that is what biblical interpretation is all about. Next slide, please. When we engage the Bible individually and collectively, we are deeply influenced by and entangled in the worldviews of the particular nation, community, family in which we live. As our 1992 report on the authority and interpretation of scripture states. So I chose the new text for today rather than the ones mentioned in the study guide because it is my hope that you have a chance to digest the biblical text in the guide with your congregations. I chose this text from the first Samuel because this may not be the well-known text for you in general, and it is probably not a common text used for anti-racist preaching. It is not in the lectionary either, but it is almost because this year, lectionary year B on June 20th has included chapter 17 of the first Samuel, which foresees the text we'll examine today. As a matter of fact, you need to bring chapter 17 in order to set the scene of the chapter 18. Chapter 17 has the famous story of David and Goliath. Everybody knows and loves that story. So I invite you to consider preaching using this text as your main, main uh, text when an opportunity arises. So let's read the text together. And uh, this is uh, from the NRS free version. And uh, Brian, our wonderful uh, educator and uh, tech person for today. Um, if you read, that would be great. And we'll just follow through the screen. Sorry, just unmuting. <clears throat> As they were coming home, when David returned from killing the Philistine, the women came out of all the towns of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they made merry, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. Saul was very angry, for this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day on. Now Saul's daughter, Michael, loved David. Saul was told and the thing pleased him. Saul thought, let me give her to him that she may be a snare for him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore Saul said to David a second time, you shall now be my son-in-law. Saul commanded his servants, Speak to David in private and say, See, the king is delighted with you, and all his servants love you. Now then, become the king's son-in-law. So Saul's servants reported these words to David in private. And David said, Does it seem to you a little thing to become the king's son-in-law, seeing that I am a poor man of no repute 
The servants of Saul told him. This is what David said. Then Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, The king desires no marriage present except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines, that he may be avenged on the king's enemies. Now Saul planned to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. When his servants told David these words, David was well pleased to be the king's son-in-law. Before the time had expired, David rose and went, along with his men, and killed one hundred of the Philistines, and David brought their foreskins, which were given in full number to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. Saul gave him his daughter Michal as a wife. Thank you so much. This has a lot in it, and um, I'm sure that we can spend hours to unpack the story. Uh, but, uh, but let me still uh, unpack a bit and summarize it and why I kind of chose this text. So Saul, the first king of Israel, is in trouble because his country is at war with the Philistines. They are powerful. They know how to use metals and are ready to fight with advanced weapons. Saul is also in trouble because he's at war with David. He realizes that people praise David more than him after his victory over Goliath. Saul's own son, Jonathan, also loves David. Saul feeling insecure and perhaps jealous as well in his kingship, plots to murder David. So he gives David a formidable task, hoping that he will die trying. Let the Philistines deal with him, Saul thinks to himself as he promises daughter Michal to David. So from this brief summary, you may be asking yourself, where is race or racism in this story? First of all, this story is about an ethnic conflict between the Philistines and Israelites. It is not easy or almost impossible to know who the Philistines were ethnically or racially since historians and archeologists say that they disappeared from the historical record when they were colonized by Assyria, Persia, then later were assimilated by the Canaanites. But they were culturally distinct from the Hebrews, and this was something that was used to perpetrate violence between them. Secondly, this story is about a political and military power struggle that led to the killing of people of that different group. This violence was the consequence of a political power fight in which the ambitions of a small group were made to all outweigh the value of the lives of other human beings who were deemed enemies and valueless because they were different. Saul was seeking to secure his power and David seemed to enjoy spilling Philistine blood in order to play along. Furthermore, in this power game, the daughter of Saul, Michal, is regarded as Chattel. The third aspect of this biblical story is that we see issues of race, sexuality, and gender are connected. How many times women have been raped as a strategy in war. Do you remember the story of Kosovo in 1989? How many times women have been sold as sexual objects or sexual property? Do you know of the comfort women, the sexual slaves of the Japanese army in the Pacific War? I'm sure you can call to mind other instances where racialized women were caught in the middle of a conflict. Killing 100 soldiers is violent enough. But this act 
was particularly troubling, holding religious and sexual nature as the bodies were mutilated and the foreskins removed from the men's penis, penises. This kind of inhumanity is not unheard of today. We have heard the stories of US soldiers humiliating and raping detainees as a form of physical and emotional torture. These are examples of racism that intersect with sexism, colonialism, militarism, Islamophobia, and heterosexist masculinity. The story in 1 Samuel 18 reveals this intersectional racism. The reason why we want to eliminate racism is to cultivate the tree of life, which is consent trickly and interdependently connected within our personal, religious, societal, material, and ecological levels. And this cultivation cannot be done without looking at the intersectionality of race. For any life to grow healthy, we need to look at the life organically and holistically. And if anti-racism has to do with cultivating the fullness of life, we must also look at racism that is killing life in interlocking ways. Race always has to be examined in relation to gender, class, and other socially constructed categories. So by now, I think we have less than 10 minutes. I intended, let me wrap up uh, my talk by inviting us as the preachers to continue to wrestle with this text. So how shall we preach on the first Samuel chapter 18? And let's imagine that we are preaching this during May, kind of celebrating Asian History Month. And I couldn't, not not talk about what happened um, at Antilana. So that's another reason. So I'll begin with a feeling, feeling thinking act. That's our homiletical movement. I'll start with a feeling by sharing a personal or any new story that might be connected and that may evoke emotion in the hearers. So let me tell you a really personal story. Last December, when my partner who is white and I were in a store wearing masks, what one white male waiting in line looked at me and made an intrusive comment about my mask without addressing or making any eye contact with my partner. I felt this person targeted me because I looked Asian. Neither my partner or not I knew exactly what the person was trying to say or why he had addressed me specifically. My partner after a moment decided that this, this was a racist edge to it, what had happened. And so approached the man to express that we didn't appreciate the way that he had addressed me. The person of course denied it that he had intended anything racist. At that time, in the news, there were regular reports of Asians being the target of verbal assaults. There was something about that interaction that left an uneasy feeling in my partner and I. In this past week, there was further attention on anti-Asian racism due to tragic news of the shooting by a white evangelical Christian man killing eight people in Atlanta, six of the victims that we read their names during the prayer are the women of Asian ancestry. This shooting is inescapably tied to race. 
But this killing is also undeniably tied to sexism, misogyny, and heterosexist masculinity. This shooting happened one week after we marked the International Women's Day and one week before today, as we marked the day for the elimination of racism. It's a tragic and terrifying story that can be easily connected to the biblical story of the first Samuel 18. So now I'll move to the thinking kind of uh, an analysis of the event in our biblical text. So the fact that many Asians have reported abuse connected to the wearing of masks and the spread of coronavirus 19, often at the hands of white males, leads us to ask what sinister thoughts are at work in our communities. I would remind people that racism can be felt personally Yet the root cause of racism is not personal. It is systemic. Since the COVID-19 was first recognized in China, violence against Chinese people and Asians in general, discrimination against them, conspiracy theories and other forms of scapegoating have been happening. And this is a global phenomenon which has in some cases been intentionally sustained for political purposes. A similar phenomenon was observed during the SARS outbreak. Ironically, while Asians are blamed for the virus, they are also the target of those who resent the use of masks. These prejudices are part of longer histories that trace back to the time of colonization and how Chinese workers were treated when they came to Canada. Under these circumstances, it is understandable why and, and if Asian Canadians feel insecure. Given these facts, I can then connect today's context with a biblical text. It can point to political tensions that are dividing two distinct, distinct groups of people. We can point to political leaders who exploit ethnic differences for their own political gain and who ignore the humanity of others in their climb to power. In the wake of the recent violence against Asian women in Atlanta, Georgia, I can point to the ways these ethnic tensions become sexualized and weaponize, leading to more ethnic violence. The context of anti-Asian racism helps me identify then who Saul would be today and who David and his man would be. And finally, and most importantly, who the Philistines in my call would be if they lived in our communities. So our final move in, in our sermon would be try to inspire the congregation to action. In this world full of senseless violence due to racism and misogyny, where is God? How do we see God working to end this intersectional racism? While examples of hope and action may not seem obvious in this biblical text, by expanding the historical and biblical lens, a movement of the spirit may be discerned. We see, for example, that Michal retains her dignity and agency throughout the books of first and second Samuel. It is true that she ends up being cursed, but she has her say and condemns David for his hypocrisy, if only in an indirect way. More generally, the prophets, prophets that make their appearance in the books of Samuel and the Kings and throughout often point to the ways God's justice contradicts the actions of the rulers of Israel. 
Nathan confronts David directly. But the prophets in general speak and care for the oppressed. They offer a counterpoint to the exploits of the kings. Next slide, please. Today, we can embrace this vision of God and God's kingdom by aligning with anti-racist movements. Do we take acts of racism against Asian and BIPOC seriously? Are there things we as Christian can do to confront racism when we see it or suspect it? Are we ready to intervene politely but firmly when we suspect an act of racism is taking place? Where can we get the training to confront racism in an effective way on a person-to-person -person level? The Anti-Racism and Cultural Diversity Office at the University of Toronto, for example, offers professional development courses for faculty and staff. Are there similar opportunities where you work or study? Our study guide may be used for this training. Are there any community organizations offering such training or programs in your region? Can we get involved in groups working against anti-racism, anti-Asian racism, anti-Black racism, and anti-Indigenous racism? Where can we go to learn more deeply and critically of the history and context of racism in Canada and the world? This deep and critical learning eventually involves actions of gathering, actions of reaching out and participating. We can also make our voices heard by showing up at protest and raising the issues in conversation with and sometimes confronting and challenging those holding power. God is there and working with them. And that is the good news. So this is the end of my presentation tonight. Briefly, I introduced our anti-racism study guide and I have highlighted a Bible passage that may be used when preaching anti-racism. And then we have drawn the outline of the sermon based on this text. I don't know how I'm doing with the time, but uh, next slide, please. But I am extremely grateful for this time together. And I look forward to your thoughtful and passionate questions. Thank you. Over to you, Adele. Thank you, Heyran. Thank you very much for what a rich presentation. Thank you for sharing your insights, your analysis, your personal story for reflecting on the shootings this past week. And thanks for moving us through the homiletical movement. Think, feel, act, and for your practical suggestions at the end. These were all excellent, so thank you very much. So now is indeed a time for questions. So um, those of us who are gathered, if you can use the chat function, then are there questions that you might have for Hiran about uh, things she's raised this evening, questions that you're wondering about? If we can use the chat function, please. And perhaps, hey, Rand, while we wait for some questions to come up, are there any additional insights that you wanted to add mm. um, from what you were talking about yeah. earlier? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I mean, I don't have any um, problem using the lectionary, if you can. And uh, But at the same time, I also noticed that some of the texts that are troubling, you know, the Phyllis Tribble called Text of Terror, uh, that might actually draw a lot more in interesting uh, insights. So feel free to be off the lectionary if you like. And, and uh, so that's one. The other thing is um, that Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, um, 
have a lot more to chew on. Um, and so I've, I've been encouraging students to uh, pay attention to the Hebrew Bible more. An interesting uh, observation that I have been over 20 years is that um, the marginalized communities and especially Afro-American um, or Afro-Canadian uh, congregations that I noticed often use Hebrew Bible way more than the gospels and others. And I just curious why is that? And partly I think it speaks a little bit more kind of directly or more bluntly on the lived experience of suffering. Um, and uh, so, you know, you know, we might all have some uneasiness of kind of using uh, Hebrew Bible as the main text of your sermon, but, uh, but there are people who are doing those and, and um, doing an amazing work. And so in terms of the, you know, preaching on race and racism, I mean, those are uh, very kind of easy thing to change and try something new. Um, and of course, their gospels and episodes have a marvelous uh, things to uh, preach on as well. But just if you want something new and something um, more challenging, you, you might say, if you are seasoned preachers, you use lectionary for time and time, and you need something different. Um, I think that's that's one easy, easy uh, solution to change. Wonderful. Thank you, hey Ren. There's a, a comment that has appeared in the chat as well as some questions. I wonder if I can read them and you can respond to um, respond to them as you would like. So the comment is that an audit of the lectionary is something that churches can do as well. Um, the first question is, what shall we say uh, beyond this statement by James Cone? To think biblically is to think in the liberating interest of the oppressed. Mm. That's the first question. Um, Shall I read the second one or would you like to respond to that one before I read the second well, one? Well, if it's related, I will uh, do it together, but it's not, then. Um, I, think, I think they're separate questions. So okay. maybe we'll go one by one. Sure. I think that's great. Um, uh, so, I mean, I mean, two things. So the, you know, there are, there are challenges, I think, of the, so-called the liberation theology paradigm. And I'm kind of biased as a post-colonial uh, person and, and studying that. Um, and uh, so as I shared in the Exodus story, right? I mean, Exodus story is really pivotal for Judeo-Christian, right? Without that, I mean, that's a proto prototype of the story. And yet we already know there is an ambivalent aspect, right? Who, whose liberation is this for at the expense of whom? Um, so in that sense, um, the, I, I think James Cohn's uh, kind of suggestion is that we should look at both ways. Um, and so not just about, uh, you know, oppressed, it's almost like the, the challenge of the being an allyship, right? It's always then put the burden or weight on the uh, marginalized or oppressed. Um, and uh, what are the kind of complicating matter as, as oppressor? And, you know, as much as I can say that I am marginalized because of my gender and my race, I'm also really privileged and probably oppressor for other otherwise as a middle class person, right? And so when you uh, always looking at one angle without also looking at others. And there are often, not always, but often at odds with each other. Then how can we kind of reconcile even our own multiply located identities, right? And so I think that James Cohn's uh, insight is there uh, are, uh, I think, really good one. Thank you. And the next question is that um, is as follows. As a white settler woman who ministers to a white settler congregation, how do I preach authentically on anti-racism when it has not been and most likely will not be something I am personally likely to experience? Mm. 
is sharing or highlighting when racism is occurring an authentic enough response? Yeah, I, I you know, that is, I think, really common challenge um, that many people might uh, resonate. Um, but I also want to say something like this, and, and uh, you know, this is a kind of United Church's national, I mean, our denominational movement. And I think um, going back to 70s and 80s, when the gender justice and sexism issue was a, a kind of center of our church's uh, movement uh, and the things that, that happened to get there for decades and decades. Um, and, and you will say exactly the same thing as a male you know, minister and you know, male members of the church, you know, what, what, is, what is the sexism for us kind of? So um, I, I think you know, as much as we've got a long way to go as a church, especially historically and currently very white um, dominant church, we also can learn from our past things that we've done from the gender to the affirming and otherwise. Uh, and, you know, I'm also believer in learning from the elders, meaning our own ancestors, right? Uh, and, you know, visibly or not so visibly, people are already doing it. So going back to the what to do with this, you know, white church and I'm white person and doing the racism. You know, good preacher is a person with integrity, right? You are not faking it. You have to be authentic to what you are called to preach. And I think it goes with the same issue um, with regard to racism. So first of all, I think all white members of the church, including the clergy and, and uh, called to be the leaders, uh, need to own your own white privilege. What then means? And how do I use this? You cannot just deny it as if you don't have it because you do, <laughs> whether you like it or not. So then use it as a way to kind of dismantle, decenter um, that position of privilege. And sometimes that is costly, right? Sometimes you have to give up. Uh, and so racism as a white congregation with white person, the preaching topic would be how to give up our power. After all, we are during the land. That's a part of repentance, part of what we as Christians are invited to do by God. Um, so the giving up and what is the giving up does lead to liberation and redemption even, right? In order to gain the eternal life, you have to give up our own, right? Um, take up the cross. Um, so what does that mean in a not abstract way, but in a very material embodied incarnational way, right? So whiteness has a face as well as race. So making that visible and, 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 and have all great stories. So all this you know, racism to me is very exciting. It's a hard work but it's exciting, grace-filled kind of uh, act, right? So it shouldn't lead us into despair or powerlessness. It should enable us to do something about it and doing that, even if we are going really slowly and, and sometimes we make a huge mistakes and upset people, whatever that may be, right? There are people who are moved by that, our very small act. And, and that is one way I would say theologically, God is pleased and, and, and recognizing that. And so, um, yeah, so what in what ways even the, those hard work lead to a joyful, um, rewarding 
um, act. And ultimately, as I said in the presentation, it's about our own journey as a full human being, trying to be fully, as fully as, as our potential uh, that is given to us. And that journey might not be the same as my journey and your journey, but we've got to take it, right? As long as our life is on earth um, stays, right? So that's, so I know it's not a good uh, answer. And, and to be honest, I think, you know, you have to figure it out. Um, but you are not alone in it. That's the, that's the good news. And that people, uh, as white people, have done amazing work uh, and, and that take that cue uh, among ourselves in this church, as well as others. Um, and, and, um, and often, I would say, uh, BIPOC uh, folks are very generous with their time and energy to teach um, and to share their lived experience, even if they are so much triggered by those experiences, the traumatize, um, it's a hard to share, right? It's a vulnerable position. Uh, you are already uh, hit by this, this racism. Uh, and yet often I find people are so gracious uh, with each other. So I think, you know, the humility is, is one thing. And the other thing is to, to make a good relationship, I think is one. So even if your churches are really white um, and, and yet your communities probably, unless you are in a really small um, communities that you, you don't see each other unless you drove like half an hour or one hour, um, even so, I find, you know, I, I, I lived in Saskatchewan for more than 10 years and, you know, in the rural Saskatchewan, right, is gas store um, or small restaurant is owned by non-white um, members. Um, and so I think that in terms of uh, our perception of the neighbors, right, the communities, the, you know, our own congregation, our own pastoral charge is important. I think we should start from there, but we are not alone, right? We, we are connected through our families, our friends, um, our neighbors, I mean, geographical neighbors as well. We are also, you know, United Church, you know, when you say United Church, I always say being United Church means being global. Right, because we have partner churches and organizations all over the world, and that we regularly pray and do work together. And so, if if they are our neighbors, then you know that should come to us in our horizons. Um, Wonderful, thank you, Hiran. There's been a couple of comments related to this question in the chat. So maybe I'll just read those and we can go back to the next question. There's actually quite a few questions that have come in recently, but here are the comments. So one person mentioned that as a lay person of color, I find it difficult to sit in the pew and hear a middle-class white female attempt to reflect on racism beyond her, person, her personal experience. So how do we make the situation real? Another person noted that white people need to talk with each other about racism. Nothing will change if they don't. Um, there's some book suggestions here. We'll come back to those ones. Um, mm. Another person shared that uh, most women have experienced some level of sexism throughout their lives. So it's not a situation um, that women are completely unfamiliar with. White people can speak to racism from positions of white privilege. White people are the one who have to fix the racism. It's not oppressed people who are responsible for this work. Uh, a couple more book suggestions. Um, another said, uh, to say white people have to fix it seems a power above others. White people need to listen, learn and humble. And a final comment that um, it's the Holy Spirit who fixes and people participate. So it's quite an, an animated conversation after, um, after that great. question, so thanks. Uh, so yeah. I'll raise the, the next question. And just to know, there's actually quite a few questions that have come in. So. Um, so this next question is the one, uh, can you speak to the fact that the Bible is inspired by God, but written through the human hand and human agenda, which clearly 
over time has distorted the wishes and hopes of God for God's people. Yes. Um, so I'll say something just before that. Um, I, I was really uh, inspired by a lay person who commented on something about it. So one way that, um, and that's a real challenge for the preachers, right? Because, you know, preaching is to a particular community of that congregation, right? It's not a universal declaration or a statement. And yet, if you cannot communicate, right, with a, with a message that resonates with the people's uh, needs and, and minds, then it's not getting anywhere, right? Uh, so one way to actually do it, and this is, to me, uh, homiletical anti-racist work, right? So how does the preaching actually happens? It's not just about the entirely subject to the preaching alone, like a preacher's solo preaching alone. And, and so, I mean, one of the kind of uh, developments over last 30 years from 1996-ish, that um, there are scholars talking about preaching as a conversation and dialogical and, and uh, but it's not just about uh, preaching during the time of the worship, but it was before and after. So kind of feed forward and feed back and in between. And, and so uh, it takes more time for preachers actually organize that, but uh, kind of doing this kind of Bible studies or even, you know, choosing the text through how, you know, what kind of message is God is telling us through this and having that kind of a pre uh, preaching um, work with the people and those lay people who are racialized will have lived experiences of racism. And if, if that is, is, is shared and reflected because of your kind of democratic, more conversational, uh, egalitarian kind of preaching practice, then even if you are called to preach um, uh, as a ministry personnel for the congregation, your message will be a lot more kind of uh, incarnated in terms of um, relevance and, and uh, drawing from the people's experiences. So that's that's one. Uh, in terms of the the, the Bible, um, I think what what you describe is very true and certainly uh, in line with our uh, understanding as a United Church. So I highly recommend actually for you to, you, if you have, have done it, great. But if you have not come across the report on General Council 1992, the authority and the interpretation of scripture is a brilliant work. And again, you know, see uh, our ancestors have done our um, predecessors. And there it was very clearly noted that uh, yes, it is in our, you know, recent Song of Faith also confirms that, right? that it is, the scripture is an inspired work of the spirit through which the humans, the communities wrote together. But because we are uh, fallible, right? We are not perfect. Being human is that we are not perfect. Um, and, um, you know, and also our lives are not a blank slate, right? We are located, limited, and influenced by our context, you know, multiple ways. And, and uh, so the scripture itself uh, has to be therefore read and interpreted through those lenses, but also scripture might have certain ways, but then our, you know, church fathers and our theologians and others also interpret a certain way. I mean, the slavery, right? I mean, the, the Noah story uh, in Genesis, um, there's absolutely no say that Noah's you know, son Ham is black and therefore cursed. There's absolutely no say in the scripture, but in the later, during the colonization and, and you know, slavery movement, that certain group of people decide to take the Bible passage to support and, and uh, perpetrate this justification of the slavery, right? So that is an interpretation 
of a particular groups. And throughout the histories, we can name after them. And then this doesn't also limit to the race, right? We already know of the, the sexism and ableism and so on and so forth, right? Um, so there are dead layers. And so when we interpret the, the Bible, knowing those as just basics, right? We don't question about that. Um, in other words, we don't take Bible literally, but we also uh, have to have a so-called Fiorenza's word, you know, homiletics of suspicion. We have to ask why. And I want to add, if you read this way, or you yourself interpret this way, who benefits? I think we always have to have to uh, if it is benefit for God, I think you are good, right? But it's benefit for certain group of people, especially at the expense of somebody else, then we gotta change ourselves. And that is a rule of faith. So there is that kind of gospel a tenor, you know. Martin Luther King Jr. talks about the kind of justice is an arc, right, toward which we go. I would also say similarly about the gospel, right? We don't know what gospel is. There are this tenor, and that tenor of gospel is to me, and some of our students who did work with me on homiletics said, it's a God's unconditional love and God's call for justice. And to me, that's the rule of faith. So nobody can take that dignity that God loves each one of us unconditionally, no matter who we are, what categories that society put on us, right? That is the gospel. And racism is sin and, and against God, right? Because it, it really opposed that, that God that we believe. And then the second is like a, um, you know, clapping, right? We need both to make the sound. And that, that God's unconditional love has to be met, meet with God's call for justice. And if our love is only sustained by oppressing somebody or discriminating somebody else, then that's unjust. Thank you, Heiren. Um, there's a few more questions, uh, but first, maybe if I can just read a couple of the comments. So one to note that there's um, the story of Charles Colcock Jones, an American Presbyterian preacher whose work was to stop slaves from running away. And uh, Charles used his platform to stop slaves from running away. He preached a sermon in the mid 19th century to a bunch of slaves with a sermon entitled, Wives Obey Your Husbands, Slaves Obey Your Masters. And after he preached, apparently the slaves directly told him that they did not care to ever hear him preach again. That's one comment. Another comment, I'm not here as a preacher, but as someone who has a community development background and I'm very interested in anti-racism. As a Jamaican of African and Arab heritage, I've been personally affected by the story of Sarah and Hagar, mm -hmm. the racial and misogynistic interconnections, and of course, Adam's role in that. Mm. So just two comments and then yeah. um, two questions. Uh, one, do you ever address the oppression of Palestinians in your class? And a second question, can you say a bit more about how we can make people feel okay about calling out the text of terror? Mm. Yeah, those are wonderful comments and, and questions. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, um, of the, the Palestinians, I mean, I think it's really, really complex. Um, Right, and, and uh, the reason why I, I, uh, I decided to tackle on the, the text today, the 1 Samuel 18, 
and partly Philistines, although, I mean, they are so oppressed and so colonized that they are, you know, they're, they're, their groups are almost uh, not there anymore. The, the kind of, you know, the so-called first indigenous people of that era, you know, which is like BC uh, 1200 years, so long time ago. But nonetheless, the fact that over the centuries, right, they've been colonized on and again and for a few hundred years and then they kind of disappeared. But, uh, but one of the reasons I thought it would be an interesting story to tell is that Philistines uh, lived where Palestine, current Palestine, um, those West Asia. I, I kind of refuse the term Middle Eastern, it's so Eurocentric, um, but uh, any of so those, you know, West Asia. And, and so I was, in, you know, the fact that they are not kind of recognizable in our standard today, you know, we could imagine that, that they were Palestinians. Right, because they, you know, one of the you know places they lived are there. Um, yes, I think, um, and that's you know, so the reason why the Exodus story is 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 challenging in many ways, despite that liberative uh, message there, that God, you know, the name of God there is deliverer from slavery. Right, how much empowering God would that be, right? So we cannot deny uh, that God, um, right? It's just throughout the, the God as liberator. God takes sides with those who are oppressed. I mean, there's just, all right. Um, however, right, it's not that simple when, you know, the, I think first uh, indigenous uh, North American uh, scholar, warrior um, wrote this, um, article and, and challenged all of us uh, in terms of, is this Exodus really liberator, uh, liberating text? Um, and uh, when the land was taken and occupied and, and the people were, you know, according to Joshua's text, utterly uh, destroyed. And so I think th that really uh, make our job hard, right? And that we cannot just opt for one, knowing that there are uh, consequences and things that are not that simple. And so I think Palestinian uh, issue currently, right? I mean, it's, it's just a primary uh, example of the colonization and European uh, kind of past um, second, so second World War issue, right? That, that the land or the nation was constructed and that, um, and from there, and because of the geopolitical material, there's oil and other things. Um, and also I would say Christian supremacist, right? That they happen to be that they are Islams. And so, you know, there is a race, there is uh, religion, and there is this capitalism, this uh, material conditions on which that this particular land of that era um, are and anti-Semitism, right? It's all, all those are, and uh, post-Holocaust kind of uh, Western guilt in there. So it is, it is really complex. And, and, um, and I think our church uh, as a denomination during the Harper era were uh, labeled as anti-Semitism, right? Semitist that uh, we are um, against Israel and so on. So, um, yeah, so I think I think we need to we need to uh, pay attention to the reasons and 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 their ongoing conflicts and uh, oppression uh, that are somehow we as Canada also in um and and the benefits of you know having that conflicts intact. What what is the cost, right? Um, and, and so it's not going to be easy solution one or the other, but the fact that we don't forget and, and uh, make uh, those realities as a part of ours and what are the similar issues that are happening in our own land here, I think is where uh, we can have a really our voice heard. Um, that's one. Um, 
the uh, what was the other uh, question? Sorry, I forgot. That's okay. The other question is about text or text of tarot. Oh yeah, yes. that is okay to use it. What's the question? Question is is to be okay to say that. Um, can you say a bit more about how we can help people feel okay about calling out okay. the text of terror? Right. So, um, I mean, some of you who've done some whiteness work uh, will share with my opinion that, you know, one of the symptoms of whiteness, and I'm implicating that, you know, so whiteness is not about skin color. So when we say whiteness as a power or some kind of privilege, it goes beyond the skin color because whiteness could be very, very prominent in the very individualistic, consumeristic capitalism. And if you are benefit from individualistic capitalism, that we are all uh, enjoying this so-called whiteness. But one of the, the kind of whiteness performed like at play is, um, kind of dealing with uh, lament and difficulties. Um, so kind of avoiding that, right? And, and kind of, you know, happy, jolly kind of being, um, right? So, you know, one of the things that I've been hearing again and again, ever since TRC is on the agenda and that we've been going through um, that process for last five, six years and during the time, how many times we heard that we need to lament. And yet, I think many of us have a hard time doing it is partly because I think that makes us really vulnerable and weak. So the very notion of, you know, kind of lament, grieve, confess our wrongdoings in a very versatile, emotional, not rational ways are kind of against our whiteness. And so that's one of the reasons I suspect that we don't preach enough of the texts that are difficult, meaning involving those lament and violence. I mean, why do we lament? Because there is loss, that there is violence, that there is suffering. And so even just put on uh, reading the scriptures that deal with those is a first step. But if you really do it well, then you gotta face those texts that are so terrible. And, but there are enough of the materials for you to uh, unpack and, and chew and, and do it. Um, you know, I mean, collectively, globally, we all lament, don't we? Because of the COVID-19. And how much more we can do if we can actually invite each other to lament and name the losses from actual loss of lives to the loss of things that we love to do as a people. And connect with those losses in the Bible. I mean, the exile, the entire Psalms are to me a lamentation. But lamentation doesn't have to be only mourning and grieving. In other words, doesn't have to be only negative. And again, it's not black and white or binary, right? We know despite the suffering, there is new life, right? Despite the grieving that you get comforting, right? My colleague from my school lost a mother. And, and you know, I mean, we all know what it's like to lose someone that you love, right? But we also know how much care that people also provide during those times. And I think that 
is where God is at work that we need to celebrate as well as acknowledge that as a beauty, as, as just absolutely divine sacredness. So you don't have to deny in order to do those. We can do both. And I, I you know, we call that holy cry. And, and uh, you know, as Korean, I often like hilarious, crazy stories that are so sad. And yet people laugh as in cry. And people cry because they are so happy. And we, we know those kind of seemingly contradictory experiences and the Bible also describes those. Um, and so, you know, I, I, there is so much um, to draw from and our own experience to articulate the things that we already know. <laughs> um, that's, that's one. Um, somebody mentioned about the um, Sarah and Hagar. I, I mean, so that's another uh, another um, story. You know, you um, the. I mean, we can we can talk about Sarah as in total like asshole <laughs> or you know real mean um, you know kind of racist. Um, from a Jewish point of view, right? Because Hagar is Egyptian and not Jews, Gentile. But at the same time, we can see that she is also victim in that kind of heterosexual patriarchy, right? That and that she can't have a child, and so that puts on her. So, um, and in the but doesn't mean that therefore what she did to uh, Hagar is justified. But we can complexify those characters that can be easily felt in, in so many of our own situations. And same thing with Hagar. I mean, so the Hagar to me is the first black theologian in the Bible um, or black feminist um, theologian in the Bible because she called her, called God. She named God first time, not Adam and Eve, but she did. And, and uh, so, but uh, the fact that she's so negatively uh, portrayed by many Christians, and I blame that for the Apostle Paul um, and, and his own interpretation of the Genesis um, and in the Galatian 4. Um, so it's, it's, it's what we know is not Genesis story, but only Galatian story from Paul and other church fathers. And so, uh, so we need to unpack that and correct because God never ever cursed her. In fact, God blessed her. So that's one. The other thing is Hagar is well revered in Islam. So in our neighbor sister religion, Hagar is mother of faith. Um, and so that's another uh, issue that we, we, we as Christian have an Islamophobic um, tendency and that's history as well as current. And so to kind of not do that, you know, one of the ways that we can preach on is to really recall, rediscover Hagar in a different way. Right? Um, Thank you. So I wonder in the time that we have left, I wonder if I can lift up the book suggestions that have been offered in the chat and then um, hand it back to you for any last words. Um, so one is uh, James Cone's autobiography uh, set, which is called Said I, said I, wasn't, said I Wasn't Gonna Tell Nobody. And the first <laughs> chapter of the book talks about how black, black folk wear masks, which is a metaphor for hiding their identities so they don't cause problems. So that's one. A second is White Supremacy and Me, um, talking about becoming a better ancestor. It's a series of 28 reflective points to have individuals walk through their own biases and perspectives. Um, so it's a question related to that. Are you familiar with it? Do you have any thoughts about working with a small group? And um, later there's a note that it's written by a person of color for white people and it engages hard reflective questions by all the participants, but does not have a facilitator. So if there's time, you can comment on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Another 
excellent book suggestion is one written by you, Heyran. <laughs> Your book called uh, Post-Colonial Preaching, Creating a Ripple Effect. So if you wanted to comment on your book, you're more than welcome to. Um, and a final book suggestion is about, uh, for, for more on Sarah and Hagar, um, Dolores Williams' book, Sisters in the Wilderness. Mm. So those are the books that have been named. Um, if you Wonderful. wanted to comment on your own book or um, <laughs> <laughs> you're more than welcome to, I don't and then I'll to. leave it with you to, so. to offer last comments yeah. and, and wrap this up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing I want to say, though, that um, so uh, several scholars of us in the Academy of Homiletics are working on a book on masking white preaching, and uh, it's it's going to be amazing. Um, that is, you know, so from white to non-white uh, scholars or preachers um, unpacking and unmasking whiteness, and and so it's in the in press. Uh, it would be coming this fall, and I'll let Adele know so that you can have it. Um, especially those of you who wanted to learn more about whiteness and how that is connected to preaching, I think it'd be a good resource. With the same publisher that my book, uh, Postcolonial Preaching is Lexington. So. Yeah, and other, uh, the um, uh, resources that you share are just excellent. Um, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer of learn learning. Um, I think learning can change uh, people. Um, but learning alone is not enough. And so as much as we need to learn because there are so much that we haven't learned. And so that's what I mean by deeply and critically, not the, on the surface level, not in the kind of, you know, tweet level, you know, that not 140 words. You have to read deeply and critically. You have to read together people. Uh, who have different experiences. So that's one, but you know, really uh, learning can be, um, cannot really bear fruit unless you engage the communities. Um, you know, I was jokingly, you know, my undergrad, you know, was computer science and nobody knows that I did that because I didn't, because I did protest instead. And so in terms of you learn uh, so much by involving uh, people's movements, whether it's uh, Black Lives Matter or missing mothers and indigenous women's, I don't know more. I mean, there are just tons of, uh, you know, organization grassroots level uh, doing all kinds of amazing work. And I truly believe that the God spirit is there. Um, and that is, is invitational for us to engage, but then bring that experience back to our uh, faith, because after all, we are Christians and we do this anti-racism work, not because it's right thing to do or human rights issues. I mean, those are okay answer, but to me, it has to come from our faith. It's the faith that calls us to respond and engage because God is already doing it. So we don't wanna miss the boat. So let's get on it and enjoy the ride together. I think I'll just say thank you and amen. Amen, thank you so much for you so all that much. you've shared this evening and thank you everyone for participating. Yes, wonderful. Yeah, there's so much hope in this room and this space. And uh, we'll, we'll see each other again. Blessings.